Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Aarhus University School of Business and Social Sciences. My name is Pierre Belsa Orgo. I am the uh, Vice Dean of Research and Talent, the latter meaning mainly PhD education. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and also sort of looking to the back rows and noticing that they are also filled. So uh, we have a grand theme, therefore a grand occasion, and uh, this is, and I should notice, this is organized by the student organization FACA here predominantly, maybe with a bit of help from the department uh, in terms of uh, financial support, I take it. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Vice Chancellor of Aarhus University and the Dean of the School of Social and Sciences. Today we're going to talk about Europe's growth challenges. In a bit, uh, FACA will introduce the speakers of this afternoon. Of course, uh, well, Europe's growth challenge is indeed a major one, and I guess probably the largest challenge, bar none, to people out of economics and business, etc. Others might say that there are other challenges as, uh, as grand, uh, but let, let's just assume this is the grandest challenge we have in front of us. So I'm hoping to sort of have someone answer questions like, is Europe really doomed for slow decline, uh, similar to that of the West Roman Empire some uh, 17, 1800 years ago, or might there be a way out or forward? And, and what may that way, if there is indeed one, involve? Uh, so I'm certainly hoping to hear presenters and the panel touch upon things like presumably migration, aging, is that a problem or is it something we can use meaningfully? Can we be proactive in terms of migration rather than sort of defensive and wall building? Now, uh, technological developments, uh, I've heard, well, I am an econ person, but I don't follow sort of uh, the, the, the most recent news. But one of the things I noticed was that Denmark in particular seems to have been, been performing really poorly since sort of the financial crisis or the, the, the economic crisis, if you want. So uh, is there something here for us to learn from listening to speakers from other places who have uh, chosen to share uh, their ideas on uh, growth in uh, Europe. So that's one thing. I, I presumably also one would expect to hear something about uh, digitalization, the import of IT into sort of all of the grains of the economy. What might that entail? Is this going to be jobless growth and therefore maybe more inequality or is it going to be job-led growth or things like that? So I'm, I'm truly looking forward to hearing, well, I'm sure I'm not going to hear the answers, but ideas on, 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 on how to think about these things in order to arrive at answers uh, sometime eventually and hopefully in not too distant future. So with those few words, since we have an exciting uh, set of uh, speakers and uh, panelists in front of us, I'll leave the floor to uh, Boris Georgiev, who is, by the way, a Bulgarian native and I think have been instrumental in uh, making sure that we can actually present our main speaker of this afternoon, which Boris will do in a bit, alongside the panel. And Boris is here also representing FACA, who are the organizers. So take it away, Boris. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome on behalf of the Finance and Consulting Club in Aarhus. Welcome to Europe's Growth Challenge 2016. On behalf of FACA, I would like to welcome you to this event, which we believe comes at a very unique time, not only for Europe, not only for Denmark, but actually for the entire world. This is why we think it's very important in our club, at least, to engage all fellow students, the community, the business society as well, in those very, very pressing challenges, because they not only affect how we live today, but they also affect how we live tomorrow in five and ten years. This is why we've taken on the mission in FACA to try and engage with the world's perhaps most prominent, most influential experts, both in the business world, as well in the academic world, and also in the policy making. This is why it's great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce you to the program for today. First of all, we're going to hear a public lecture on Europe's growth challenge delivered by Professor Simeon Diankov. Furthermore, we're going to pause for a 15-minute break where you can uh, enjoy in the Upper S building uh, drinks uh, as well as some uh, chocolate and other confectionery. <laughs> 
Afterwards, we're going to transition with a panel debate, which is going to feature uh, three other prominent uh, business and economic experts. So in our lineup, we have Professor Philip Schroeder from Aarhus BSS. As well, we have uh, Klimis Jara, who is a senior partner and director at McKinsey & Company Denmark. And as well, Bo Sandeman Rasmussen, who is a professor at Aarhus BSS as well. Without further ado, let me introduce the main public lecture today. So, Professor Simon Dankov, Bulgarian native, has been a former Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of the Republic of Bulgaria in the period 2009-2013. Prior to that, he spent more than 14 years at the World Bank, starting as a consultant and at the end reaching the level of a Vice President and as well Chief Economist of the World Bank. Uh, before several years, he also used to be a rector of the New Economic School in uh, Moscow, Russia. Currently, he's a professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He not only has been very involved in policy making and the most pressing public debates worldwide, but also during his tenure at the World Bank, he has conducted numerous uh, projects for governments in transition in North Africa, as well in the Caucasian region, and has advised numerous governments on their most important problems uh, that they have faced. Furthermore, he has been extremely active in the academic field. Uh, during his career, he has managed to publish more than 70 scholarly articles in among what you may call some of the most influential economic journals. And I believe his expertise and mix between expertise from government, politics, as well as economics, makes him a unique guest and a person who definitely we can learn a lot from, from his public lecture. Without further ado, let me introduce Simon Diankov, London School of Economics and Political Science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, frankly, I'm quite surprised to see uh, such a large interest in this, uh, in this topic. Um, I've uh, presented on similar uh, issues in a number of other European um, countries, uh, and uh, um, interest uh, has been there, but nowhere such, such, such a large interest, so I really look forward to um, today's uh, presentations. We've organized them in a way that I would uh, first uh, be an economist, so show you some economic facts, economic and social facts about Europe, just to lay the foundation for what then uh, I hope would be a discussion for not only what are the problems, but also what are some of the solutions to these uh, uh, problems, at least that, uh, that we can uh, discuss. Uh, and I'll start first with this very basic uh, uh, figure. I should mention that you don't have to be an economist. Hopefully you don't have to be an economist to follow the discussion and participate in the discussion today. Uh, as long as you understand this particular figure. Uh, which is essentially looking at the last roughly 65 years of uh, uh, Europe's economic development uh, very soon after World War II. Uh, this is the average of all of uh, Europe as we know today, the European Union as you know, as we know today. And noticing that every decade or so, growth goes down and down and down to the point where the official statistics of the uh, European Union, the uh, so-called Eurostat, the European Statistical Office, basically predicts that if things go the way that they are going now, uh, the decade of the 2020s, or just in five years' time, basically would be a no-growth decade, or between zero and one percent uh, growth on average for uh, the European uh, Union. In other words, stagnation. So by the time that many of you joined the uh, job market or start looking for careers in business or in government or uh, uh, in other walks of life, uh, the opportunities would be not as good as they were in previous, uh, previous decades. Uh, on this chart, incidentally, you also see how uh, painful the recent Eurozone crisis was, or the financial crisis in Europe, this very big uh, spike uh, downwards, 2009-2010. Europe then recovered somewhat, but you see that rather than go continuing to go up after 2010-2011, growth actually has again uh, uh, been uh, essentially around zero to one uh, percent. 
So what we'll be talking today, both in my presentation and uh, in the discussion, is what are some of the reasons for this uh, low growth, how it compares to the main competitors of uh, Europe, that is the United States or America more generally, and uh, rising Asia, and then what can we do about it. Uh, and I'll have the luxury of suggesting some uh, uh, solutions, but leaving it for the rest of the panelists to provide the main solutions. Um, in most of what I'll do, I'll compare uh, where data exists between Europe and the United States. Uh, and you'll see towards the end, hopefully, what's the rationale uh, of, uh, of this. Partly it's data, Asia, which is also a main uh, competitor of um, Europe doesn't have as long of time series, but where it does, we'll be showing that uh, as well. But again, if you now go about uh, uh, 45, 50 years uh, uh, history and look at the until recently original EU 15 and the United States, you'd notice that until about the Eurozone crisis, so until five or six years ago, Europe on average was actually producing, together the EU 15, were producing um, more than the United States uh, uh, economy. This fact is uh, often uh, because uh, the US economy and especially in the new technology sector has been so dominant in recent years, people forget that if you look at long-term statistics, Europe actually has been bigger than uh, the US economy for um, most of our modern history. But just around 2011, 2012, that ceases to be the case. And now the uh, American economy, largely on the expansion of new industries, uh, has overtaken the uh, European economy in terms of uh, overall production. Um, and then what we are going to do in a series of, uh, of uh, charts, um, uh, so I'll show you a lot of data, and then we'll have more of a discussion. Um, uh, I'll show you a dozen or so charts to basically start asking the question, well, where is Europe lagging? So what's happening? Can we find this from looking at different, uh, different markets? So one market, if you want to produce, if you want to have economic growth, uh, well, it's useful to have people who actually produce, people who are uh, gainfully employed uh, in, uh, in the economy. So one thing that we will be uh, uh, comparing is uh, the employment rate. This is not the same as an employment or employment. Uh, basically, the employment rate says of the people who are of working age, so if you exclude kids and if you exclude, exclude people who are already retired, so you just leave people who, um, who uh, can work, um, what is the percentage in, on average in uh, countries that are actually employed? So the opposite of that would be people who have decided not to work for one reason or, uh, or another or, or have reasons not to, uh, uh, not to work. The higher this percentage is, obviously, it means that the more of the active population is involved in uh, economic activity and that's better for the economy. So first, just looking at the last two, and notice that here the statistic includes uh, all European Union 28, including Croatia, so we are completely up to date in this uh, analysis. We already not notice that there is really a five percentage points difference between how many Americans work and how many Europeans work. So already we see that uh, uh, a sizable part of the people who may work in Europe have decided not to, more so than uh, in the United States. And then it's very interesting to look across countries. Incidentally, one topic that um, um, for me has been very interesting coming out of Eastern Europe is to compare Eastern Europe to Western Europe, but also Southern Europe to the rest of, um, to the rest of Europe. The first country perhaps is not surprising, but is just striking how, how different it is. So basically, um, in Greece, more than half of the active working age population does not work. It's quite a striking, striking, uh, striking uh, statistic to, to ponder. So these are not uh, students, these are not people who have not grown to be in the market, and these are not retired people. These are the people between the ages of 18 and 64 that in principle should be involved in uh, economic activity. 
So in Greece, about 48% of uh, the working age population is uh, involved in uh, such activities. So more than half, actually not. The rest of the population, in other words, has to produce for them um, uh, as well. If you look at this graph, you quickly say, well, it's no surprise that Greece has uh, lots of uh, economic and financial uh, problems. Uh, but I've put a number of countries, first to say that Denmark does very well on this, uh, on this uh, chart and uh, that uh, in, in particular it's one of the few countries that outperformed the United States. There are six or seven uh, European countries that outperformed the United States in terms of uh, employment uh, rate. Notice that uh, they are uh, primarily in the northern part of, uh, of Europe, exception is Austria, which is in Central Europe, but Sweden, uh, Netherlands, Denmark, uh, the UK, Estonia, are countries where uh, more than 70% of the population, uh, working age population, uh, works. And basically, the more you go from north to south of Europe, to southern Europe, population decides that maybe working is not such a good idea. There are other things that uh, are more exciting to do than, uh, than uh, work. We'll find later on what, uh, what this results in. Then we look at another statistic, uh, which is of the people who work, how much do they actually work? So how many hours do they actually, uh, how many hours do they actually work? And here I compare again the United States to France, a country that typically is not thought as uh, the most hardworking uh, European, uh, uh, European country. Uh, but I purposefully picked uh, France just to point out that if you go back 50 or so years, the average uh, French worker was actually working about 15% longer than the average American worker. This is annual, annual data, how many hours a year you uh, you work. So France is in the red, about 2,200 hours uh, on average a year. The average French, French work uh, about 1,950 hours in the uh, US. But you go over time and somewhere in the early 80s that changes, and it changes then dramatically and continues to change over time, where basically Europeans work less and less. Americans basically have kept up pace. So they've reduced a bit the working load, but not too much. Uh, so it's a very, st very stable um, line. Now if you look at some of the uh, Asian countries on this line, for example Korea, you would see much higher average working hours and basically a straight line. So they work and they work consistently year after year. So there is no, um, let's say, trade-off between working hours and uh, having fun. Uh, but in Europe, we like to have fun, and we have more and more fun over time. So few people work, and these who work don't work as much. Uh, we learn from these two uh, pictures. Now we go to a different topic and say, well, so we don't work as much. Uh, those who um, work also take more time, but maybe we're much smarter. And as a result, we don't have to work as hard because we're better educated. Uh, so this uh, uh, panel basically looks first at high school education, secondary education, and then I'll go to university education that, that may be uh, more interesting for you. This also is quite a striking chart, to me at least one of the most striking charts in, uh, in this analysis. So the question is very simple, not how good a student you are, but how many students who start high school graduate. Um, and I should say that there are wide differences within the United States across states. So the further south you go, fewer students graduate. But on average in the United States, nearly 90%, 9 out of 10 uh, students graduate, 88.3%. In Europe, it's 10 percentage points lower, so 78% of students in high school graduate. But again, notice who are... Um, the outliers, so to speak, the countries in red. So these are essentially, actually not essentially, but completely southern European countries, without exception. And because these numbers may be hard to believe, at least to some of us, I hope they're hard to believe, uh, let's just uh, read one or two countries. So what this number means that uh, in Portugal, let's say, that of the class that enters uh, uh, high school, at age uh, 10, 11, 
uh, uh, 12, only 40% graduate. So the rest of, uh, uh, of the uh, high schoolers basically leave school before actually they have a high school diploma and start either working or not working as we've seen, uh, uh, seen before. So in other words, attrition is huge. Uh, and again, notice the, um, the pattern of, um, of uh, southern European countries being particularly pronounced in, in, in having very little comparative uh, education and completion rate. The more you go towards Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, you see higher and higher, um, higher, and higher completion rates. You see here some of the um, East European countries that do quite, uh, uh, quite well basically because uh, high school education was mandatory under socialism, so you had to graduate. So if you go 10, 15 years back in time, it would be 100% for countries like Lithuania, the Czech Republic, Poland, and so on, even Bulgaria. It's starting to fall, uh, fall down. But critically, uh, you see Southern Europe, where if you continue to follow this logic, um, not many people work, those who work don't work much, but those who uh, uh, work not as much, actually not that well educated. Many of the people who drop out uh, joined uh, the labor force early. And then we go to universities. Um, I was recent just in discussion with some of your um, uh, faculty and we discussed some of the university reforms that have gone on over the last decade or so here in um, Denmark in uh, trying to agglomerate universities and to bring higher uh, quality as a result. Incidentally, the, Bu the Bulgarians in the audience may know that I tried when I was deputy prime minister to do the same reform in Bulgaria and miserably failed. Um, did not work at all. Um, uh, I had all of these um, esteemed professors coming and saying, what do you know about education? I said, well, I'm reasonably educated. I've taught in a number of universities, no, you don't know anything about education, so didn't work out. Uh, but let's compare these uh, two, there I think by now, four different international um, indicators, uh, rankings on uh, uh, university uh, quality. You can argue that some of them are biased, so for example, the Financial Times ranking, even though it claims it's unbiased, has many British universities, and given that the Financial Times is British, you know, it looks a bit suspicious. The Shanghai Index, uh, which you can imagine is uh, somewhat related to Shanghai and Asia, has uh, more um, Asian uh, universities among the top, but that's why we take several, so I show you the two main ones. And it just asks the question, all together, all universities in the world, let's rank them on quality of education and see where they are. Not surprisingly, the vast majority are in the United, well, not the majority quite, um, actually, yes, the majority above, uh, half of them are in the United States, uh, and in the case of the Shanghai uh, Index, over 65% actually are in the United States. The UK has uh, uh, some, the Oxfords, the Cambridge, I think the London School of Economics also makes it. Um, but then you look at continental Europe. So continental Europe is all of the European Union except for um, the UK. And basically you notice that on one index uh, there are only two, and on the other index there are six uh, European universities all, uh, uh, all together that are in this index. So basically it's either 3%, 2 to 3% of uh, the top universities or, uh, you know, 10% of the top universities in the world. Given that education, university education, as we know, it started in Europe centuries ago, you know, this is not great. This means that we are lagging behind, uh, very significantly behind uh, the US, uh, the UK, and increasingly uh, Asia. The others are basically... Uh, Asia. I'll come to, bit to this point uh, in a bit more detail uh, later. I'm at the end of this random, what may seem to be a, to you random picture, so I'll come to a point very soon. Um, but let me show you two more graphs. So one other topic that is very discussed, uh, not just in Europe, but across the world on how do you grow, by basically by bringing edu uh, more educated people, more creativity, more innovation is asking this question of uh, if you take the 100 largest European companies, a US um, 
companies. Basically, rather than saying they're in these sectors and they are subjectively this creative or that creative, let's basically assume that the newer the company is, the more innovative it is. It's not always the case, but let's assume to a first approximation that uh, companies that were established more recently, uh, perhaps because they have better technologies or because they're in new sectors, are more, uh, have more innovation. And then you just look among the 100 companies in Europe and the US, how many are established before 1950 and how many are established uh, more recently. Basically, the answer from this graph is that uh, Europe has uh, long-standing companies that uh, haven't really changed much in terms of the mixture of uh, top, uh, top uh, companies in Europe, while in the United States, nearly half of the companies are relati relatively new. So this would be the Microsofts and Googles and uh, uh, Facebooks and, uh, uh, and so on, uh, but not just high-tech companies. There are many other sectors, for example, energy, where in the United States uh, there are a number of new companies uh, that have been um, created just in the last uh, decade or so. So what this shows, in other words, or maybe it doesn't show it, but it's a, a manifestation of the ability to innovate and to grow very fast, uh, given that uh, you start from um, scratch, that you're essentially a startup. That, as we'll talk in a minute, depends on a number of things. Uh, for example, do you get access to capital? So we'll talk about capital uh, very soon. How large is your market? Do you have a market of 350 million Americans, as the US market is? Do you have a market of less than 10 million, like Bulgaria or, um, uh, or Denmark? Or do you have the 500 million uh, European uh, market that we think we have, but actually in most sectors we don't? So I'll discuss this uh, in a moment. I'll quickly go from my favorite topic, which is, however, not the main topic of, uh, of this uh, presentation, to note that, uh, so if you don't have much, many people producing, as a result, uh, you don't have much production, much ability to, um, uh, to tax, uh, essentially. Uh, and so the state has to do more, or at least many states, many governments, things that then this is a natural cue for them to come in and do a lot. Uh, so what this shows is that uh, uh, this basically says how much the government spends out of the overall expenditure in any one year, this is 2014, uh, per, per country. So how large is the government in providing services? This is health, education, security, uh, infrastructure, all kinds of uh, uh, services. Here, unlike many of the pictures that I showed you, it's not necessarily that low means good or high means good. This is just uh, to understand how European economies, or actually societies, not just European economies, uh, operate. This number, I've not put it on this picture, for the United States is around 35%, 34.6%. So it's about 10 percentage points less than the average uh, for um, the EU. So on average, the US government, not just the central US government, but also the regional governments, collectively are responsible for about a third of total expenditure in the United States. In uh, the European Union, you can see that there are several countries, including uh, Denmark, that basically more than half of overall expenditures are basically uh, done, um, I guess, on behalf of the citizens uh, by, uh, by the government. And later on, and I'm certain in the discussion, we'll get to this point, is this a good thing if the government is more than half, basically, of all expenditure? Is it uh, not such a good uh, thing? I'll just in passing mention that Eastern Europe on this chart is where uh, public is expenditure is lower, partly because coming out of uh, communist years, basically there was a natural tendency to have more, so, so to speak, right-wing policies to reduce the role of the government. So you see countries like Romania, Latvia, my own country, Bulgaria, that are below 40% public expenditure to, um, uh, to GDP. I should also... Uh, note uh, in passing that if you go even 25 years back in Europe's uh, uh, history, you would see that everybody is actually uh, spending a lot less. So public expenditure was significantly low 25, 30 years ago, and then gradually crept up. Year after year, it crept up. 
Why is this important? Because this is linked in many countries, probably also in Denmark, but it's certainly part of the current Brexit debate in uh, the UK that one of the reasons why we don't want to be part of Europe is, or the European Union, uh, is because uh, Brussels imposes a lot of regulations on us that cost a lot of money and therefore we end up spending a lot, a lot of money, public money, to, um, uh, to basically deal with, uh, with regulations from Europe. This is actually not quite true. I, in fact, it's very little true. While it's true that Brussels imposes many silly regulations, historically, if you see when uh, uh, European governments started spending more and more, in essence, it precedes the enlargement of uh, the European Union and uh, various silly regulations that were imposed. So Europe just decided basically to spend more and rely more on governments. But by now, I think if you haven't been depressed coming to this lecture, by now you should be quite depressed um, because it all looks terrible. So I'll, s I'll quickly point out some good things about Europe, so you don't think that it's all, uh, that it's all bad. Despite everything that we've uh, uh, mentioned, and despite many issues that every one of the European uh, Union uh, countries uh, has, generally most economists and social scientists agree that uh, one of the, perhaps the main precondition of, uh, of having economic growth and successful economy is having a rule of law. Basically, if I'm a private uh, entrepreneur, private firm, and some other private firm is doing something that basically is damaging me, I could go to the regulator or the courts and argue my case, and if it's a just case, succeed. Or if I have an argument vis-a-vis -vis the government, and the government is doing something bad, which most governments tend to do, then, uh, uh, then I can go again to the courts or to the independent regulator and argue that this uh, wrong should be uh, righted. So the rule of law, it comes in various um, guises. Mostly people think of the judicial system, but it's not just the judicial system, it's also uh, the regulatory system, is the number one um, precondition for successful economic growth. So if we look on that, actually most of the EU except for my own country and Greece, look quite good. Uh, and I should say here that uh, previous Bulgarian governments are responsible for the state of the Bulgarian, but uh, it's not our government. But you see that on this indicator, this is uh, between 0 and 10, it verges between 0 and 10, when if you're, let's say, in... Um, uh, let's pick a country, um, Tajikistan basically is 0, so, you know, there is no rule of law, the president decides everything, and uh, in, in fact, I think last week the Tajik president decided that he would be a president for life. And it was very easy, everybody agreed. They didn't need a referendum, just government decree, president for life. So that would be a zero, and you go to as high, Finland actually, which is highest in the European Union, is also highest in the world, at nearly uh, a nine. But you generally see that a fairly large number of European countries, about a third of the European Union, performs quite well. Here I've shown relative to the US, but it performs particularly well if you compare to China, Korea, and so on. So actually we are very significantly above the rest of the even industrialized uh, world uh, in terms of uh, the rule of uh, law. And again, mostly northern uh, northern uh, Europe, uh, but also some of the former East European countries like uh, Poland, which is good news if you get a few other things right. It basically means that you have a good fundamental for growth in some of Europe, others have to catch up. Uh, and in, on that particular indicator, enough European countries are even ahead of our main competitors, so we can hope to uh, achieve uh, better things if we try more. Um, well, why haven't we then? So we have a good uh, uh, rule of uh, uh, law. I've showed you some of the other reasons for why we haven't. Um, but I'm coming back to this topic of uh, university education, uh, innovation, also linked to the innovative uh, companies. So this is again sort of a public finance view, just asking the question of each country, how much of its uh, GDP every year it spends on research and development. Most of this happens in the business community, but a lot of it happens also in universities like uh, 
like uh, uh, this university. This is not necessarily a pure measure of innovation because some countries can spend a lot and it can be totally ineffective. Uh, but generally, more expenditure on research and development goes well with uh, subsequent uh, innovation. So we notice here that the United States, which I already mentioned, actually has a lot uh, smaller share of government overall. So this is not really organized by the government, or at least not much of it. Spends about 2.8, nearly 3 percentage points of GDP on uh, research and uh, and development. We have a few European countries, which is again good news, including Denmark very prominently, Sweden and Finland that spend 3% or more, uh, which is very good news. Then we have, fortunately not Bulgaria this time, Romania, which spends basically nothing on research and uh, uh, development. And in general, with the exception of Belgium, um, the rest is mostly Southern Europe and a bit of Eastern Europe spend very little on research and development. The result of that is that the exports that come out of this region, of the Southern and East European region, basically are not uh, R&D intensive. In fact, during, I mentioned, or it was mentioned that during the Eurozone crisis, I was finance minister, so I spent many sleepless nights in Brussels arguing with other finance ministers whether Greece belongs to the European Union, or doesn't belong to the European Union and the Eurozone. And at some point, we decided to look at basic trade statistics to, sh to, to see if uh, public finances in, uh, in Greece get better, basically how the economy could grow. Uh, Incidentally, even to date, the Greek economy hasn't grown over the last uh, few years. But basically, what does, um, what does Greece export? What are its main competitive uh, products? Um, in small audience, I'll just ask a few people, but I think it will be embarrassing to <laughs> ask in such a large uh, um, audience. And basically, the answer is nothing. So Greece exports nothing. So it has, in terms of its official statistics, it exports um, uh, what's called maritime services, shipping. But basically the reason that it ex exports shipping is that in the Greek constitution until very recently, it was written that shipping companies are not charged any taxes, zero. So you don't pay any taxes if you are a shipper in uh, Greece. And that, you can imagine, came from, um, how to put it politely, I wouldn't call it corruption, just a lot of successful lobbying on the part of the sector at a certain stage in, uh, in Greece's development. But basically about 25 to 30 percent until recently of uh, Greek's export statistic was shipping, which wasn't, some of it is actually Greek, but most of it wasn't Greek, it just registered in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Greece. And then another about 30% is related to olives. So it's either olive oil or pressed olive oil or hot pressed olive oil or olives or, or essentially olive derivatives. So really check the statistics. Another 30% is related just to olives. And then there is another about uh, 30 to 40% that is mostly agric other agriculture, non-olive agricultural products. So there is some wine, which is, you know, not great if you've tried it, but, <laughs> you know, somebody must be drinking it. And there is wuzu, which is, you know, better to uh, drink and so on, but basically it's agriculture. So if you are, you know, reasonable, reasonable economist, even undergraduate level economist, and you've gone through your first two years of economics, and you ask the question, a country like Greece, looking at the exports, how can it grow? Basically, you don't have a good answer. Can't really, something else has to happen. But then for it to happen, you either need research and development, you need more people in universities, more people in, uh, in uh, secondary schools and uh, so on. Anyhow, a diversion, a diversion to get to the main point that uh, we, with the very few exceptions in uh, basically the Nordic countries plus Germany and Austria, we don't really spend that much on research and, uh, uh, and development. My favorite uh, picture, it was, I think, mentioned uh, in the introduction that when I was at the World Bank, I started this um, actually academic initiative that ended up as a policy initiative called Doing Business, where we asked a very simple, well, several related very simple questions. If 
Some of you are not uh, familiar yet with the Doing Business Report. It's one of the most exciting publications in the world. You definitely should be um, uh, should look at it. But it basically asks many, many both academics and many uh, politicians when they have nothing better to say about business, they say it should be much easier to start a new business. So we're going to make it easier to start a new business. So in this project that we start started about 12, 15 years ago by now, we said, well, let's take the same type of company around the world and let's ask three questions. If you want to start it, how long would it take you? how much it would cost you, and how many different procedures, basically how many different agencies you would have to go to. So very simple questions. And we looked at what the laws and regulations would provide for that. So that's one of the sub-indices, which is called uh, uh, the ease of starting a business. And similarly, we have several other type of indices. If you're a business, you deal with, for example, an index on paying taxes, which asks the question, if you're a small business and you want to pay your taxes, how difficult is it? How often do you have to pay taxes? Can you pay them electronically or not? Um, um, how many hours does it involve senior management or you, if you're the entrepreneur, to pay these uh, uh, taxes? And basically, what are the legal procedures? And we go, you know, how do you get a business license? How do you uh, enforce a contract in the courts and so on? So 10 or 11 different uh, topics to get to this, uh, to this uh, index of how easy or not it is to start uh, a business. This is basically the regulation, what the state provides for businesses to operate uh, uh, relatively easily or not so easily. And it covers essentially every country in the world. The index has by now 189 countries. Uh, around the world, and every year we rank them 1 to 189. Uh, um, and then we ask the question, who is best, who is worst, but also who is improving? So if you look from year to year, you see who is moving up, who is moving, um, uh, who is moving down. So looking across the European Union, we notice that the hosts, Denmark in particular, is actually best in Europe. On, uh, on ease of doing business. Now, if you're in your country, and you, if I'm presenting this to businesses, and I've presented this literally hundreds of times to businesses, nobody would agree that their country is better in anything. So they would say, no, our government is extremely inefficient, is very slow, taxes are very high, which is probably true. And generally, it's difficult to run a business. But this is comparing across different countries in the world on a number of indicators, and it basically says, all things considered, actually, Denmark is number three in the world. The, the numbers signify out of 189 uh, where you uh, stand. Um, number one is Singapore, and number two is, I think, New Zealand for this uh, for 2015. So. Um, Asia performs quite well on these indicators. Um, but beyond that, you actually see, which is, I think, good news, that a number of the European countries, not only um, Denmark, uh, do quite well. Incidentally, this is a chart that is very favored in Brussels when we discussed issues of Brexit or Greece leaving or anybody else wanted to leave or do something uh, crazy with the European Union because it shows why countries like Denmark and like the United Kingdom should stay in the European Union, in my mind, which is to improve the doing business rating of all the other countries in the European Union, but also uh, more seriously to uh, improve overall the way that, doing b that business uh, operates in the European uh, Union. Why? Because often when we do um, analysis of the European Union and how it can grow better and uh, prosper, we do these comparisons that I started with. Well, the United States is better in this, better in that. Asia is better in this, better in that. And then you come to this point, well, they are different, but there is a reason for that. So somehow they're different than us. Institutionally, culturally, um, infrastructure-wise, they're different. So it may be difficult for us to do the same that uh, uh, what the US does. But it's very difficult for somebody to argue when you put a picture like this and says, Denmark, you know, nice country, but not too different from some of the other countries in uh, Eastern Europe. Why is it significantly better in um, ease of doing business than, let's say, the Netherlands? You know, similar Northern European um, 
countries, people like bicycling, so its culture must be quite similar. But yet, there are significant differences between, or Luxembourg even. Actually, in Luxembourg, people don't like to bike much, but um, there are the similarities. Or let's find if they are similar, they should be able to be to 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 be able to implement similar regulations. So let's actually implement this better, but not get uh, you know Belgian regulation to Denmark, but get Danish regulation to Belgium, and British regulation to um, well, I wouldn't say Italy, but um, you know other countries in um, in uh, the European Union. So if you have the top countries being frustrated and basically saying, okay, enough with Europe, you know, it's too painful and we don't want to be part of it. What's going to happen with the rest of Europe? Well, it's going to be worse because there isn't this pool of the top performers, if you like, to say the whole of the European Union has to be like us. So we need to improve and maybe even better than um, uh, even better than us. But still, the positive uh, view from this picture is that still all of Europe, even Greece, uh, is actually in the first half of the global picture on ease of doing business. So um, uh, there are many countries behind us that uh, still haven't figured out how uh, businesses should operate relatively easily. I imagine one of the favorite topics to discuss in Denmark is uh, taxes. Uh, so I'll show you just two different pictures of, um, of uh, taxes. But first to note that uh, in terms of at least corporate tax policy, Europe is actually better than the United States. Um, and I think most businesses who've worked in both continents would tell you that um, while the US uh, is better in many dimensions, tax policy is quite, quite painful. Um, in the US. Of course, larger US corporations hide taxes, mostly by coming to Europe and hiding it here, but uh, or in other parts of the world. Uh, but you would see that both uh, the level of taxation, generally speaking, and also the direction of uh, taxation has been um, beneficial uh, to, uh, to Europe, actually. Yes, Denmark is, uh, is there as well. So in particular, you see that in the last roughly 25 years, corporate taxes have been falling. In some countries, like in Ireland, you see a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous fall over the, 20, the last 25 years. Uh, this picture should have had Bulgaria, which has actually the lowest corporate income taxes of any European country at 10%. In fact, if we have managed to be good at something in... Uh, government in Bulgaria, it's uh, tax policy. So we have what's called a, a flat tax. I recommend it to Denmark. Um, so we have 10% personal income tax, 10% corporate income tax. Um, uh, basically everything is 10%. So regardless of which tax you're looking at, it's 10%. And we have nothing above it. So uh, regardless of what you produce, it's 10%. It's easy to... Um, it's easy to remember. And incidentally, when we had in 2010, 11, 12, all of these discussions uh, on uh, taxation in the European Union, uh, the Germans in particular and the French were always very excited to say we should have uniform taxation so that nobody cheats on taxes, as if nobody in France cheats on taxes. Um, uh, and then I would say that's a great idea. Let's have Bulgarian taxation. It's easy, 10%, non... non um, Finance people can understand it, and sort of that always killed the discussion that, you know, it has to be uniform, but at the French level, not at the Bulgarian level. Uh, but on taxes, well, in, uh, businesses can complain, and I'm sure that in Denmark businesses do complain of high taxation. Note that, relatively speaking, uh, actually taxes, corporate taxes uh, in Europe have both been falling, and historically, actually, are not as high as they have been in... Um, on average, the exceptions in uh, the United States. This, this would be even more surprising to you, and it goes towards the end of my um, uh, presentation of say, well, what Europe has is that corporate income taxes are, I wouldn't say low, but at least uh, falling. Personal income taxes are very high, as they are in Denmark, uh, but not in Bulgaria and not in many of the East European countries. But on top of the personal income taxes, this is basically what individual pays when they, uh, when they get their income, uh, labor taxes, which is essentially what you pay for social security and also for pension contributions if your pension system is mostly publicly funded, are also very high. Now, why am I focusing on labor taxes and not on personal income um, 
taxes? Well, because a lot of uh, economic academic research over the last decade has been trying to find this answer why so many able people, able-bodied working age people are not working. So what prevents them from entering the labor force? And there are different um, explanations, but one preponderance explanation is basically this, that if you have very high social security taxes, which are levied, I should say, on your wage, so you come as a first-time worker, so you finished university or high school, you joined the labor force, you don't have a very high wage, at least uh, most of the cases. On top of that uh, uh, wage, you immediately levied uh, this additional labor tax, essentially so that in the future you can be covered uh, for health care, for pension, and uh, so on. So in a way, it uh, creates this disincentive for uh, employers, for businesses, to hire people who are less experienced, because regardless of how experienced or not experienced you are, you still have this essentially add-on on your, on your uh, wages, on your wage bill to pay. Uh, so there is a lot of fairly convincing academic uh, uh, research to say that the higher the labor tax, the less the new generation, the just educated generation of uh, uh, young, young uh, workers, employees, join the labor force. They basically say, well, you know, if I join, I'll have to pay a lot of social security taxes, plus it's difficult for me to be employed because employers don't want me. They want somebody who is already experienced, five, ten years, and, uh, uh, and uh, has essentially the capacity to understand better the work process. I, pointed, I put this graph here mostly as good news to Denmark within the general bad news on tax policy um, to say that uh, a few years back, Denmark actually significantly reduced social security taxation essentially following this very logical economic uh, argument that unfortunately few politicians follow in any country in the world, which is to say if you reduce social security taxes, directly uh, levy it uh, on uh, wages, chances are your labor participation, your employment rate will go up. And actually, if you look in Denmark, not just in Denmark, some other countries have done this as well, before and after, the reduction in labor uh, taxes, you would see that employment, the employment rate actually goes up very, very, very uh, convincingly very soon after this is uh, uh, done. But this picture is more for countries like France and uh, uh, Belgium and uh, Germany even in this case and Greece of saying, you know, one thing that you need to do is somehow reconfigure your tax policy don't have this type of direct taxation on, uh, on labor and shift it somewhere else. Where else? I think we'll discuss, uh, we'll discuss in a bit. Uh, this is just a picture from the doing business, uh, the early uh, um, argument that I met, but specifically to taxes, that one thing is how much tax you pay, and another thing is how painful is it for you to pay this, uh, 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 this uh, tax. To note again that in the area of taxation, excluding the Czech Republic, Portugal and Italy, um, most of Europe is actually quite uh, competitive with the United States. So it's not the case that the United States here have figured it uh, out. And if you follow presidential debates in the United States, I'm sure now you do because it's fun, you notice that every presidential candidate says that they'll change the tax system and it has not been changed for about 60 years. So they fail miserably to change, uh, to change the, tax, uh, the tax system. So now I'm getting to the final part of my uh, presentation, uh, just uh, three or four more slides of saying, okay, so we now hopefully have sort of an idea of what are some of the problems and how they compare to the rest of the world, but also what are some areas that we can build on, like the rule of law or the fact that regulation on business, while it clearly has uh, some um, differences across European countries, uh, still is by and large better than uh, in the rest of, uh, in the, rest of uh, the world. So what are areas that we can build on? And these I'm going to just pick some areas to hopefully uh, incite uh, uh, discussion after all these are by no means all the uh, all the areas well one topic uh, is digital trade so this is an area where Europe actually has some comparative advantage in the sense that we have high internet penetration much higher than in the rest of uh, 
of, uh, of the world, even in Southern and Eastern Europe. In fact, Bulgaria, my own country, is among the top 10 countries in the world in internet penetration, um, as are two or three of the other East European countries, all the Nordic countries um, uh, around you, and I think Austria. So out of the top 10, eight actually are European countries. Among the top 10 in internet penetration in the world, eight are European countries. So that's great, but then if you look at, uh, at some basic uh, measures like online uh, banking usage, it's increasing over time, but it's actually not great. Well, in Bulgaria, it's not great at all, uh, but uh, even in countries like Bulgaria, or the average of the European Union is not so great. Why is that the case? Well, there are several reasons I'm simplifying, but one reason is that uh, while Europe is supposed to have a single market, single economic market, so we should be able to trade everything um, seamlessly without any trouble in the European Union. In the area of digital trade, actually there is no single market. There are 28 very distinct uh, markets. So if you attempt to um, either do online banking from Bulgaria, let's say, to Denmark, um, and transfer money or do some other types of uh, payment transactions and so on. Or in most European countries, if you try to buy something over the internet and uh, receive it, chances are you're not going to be able to succeed. Or if you succeed, it's going to cost you a lot. Um, why is that the case? Well, we can discuss hopefully. But basically, the answer is that there are several of the large European countries, like France, for example, that are very protective of their market and basically say that or have said until recently that they don't really want single digital market because it somehow endangers um, cultural identity of uh, countries and people and, uh, and so on. So as a result, one of the key markets that has propelled countries like the United States over the last 10, 15 years or Korea over the last 10 years in terms of economic growth does not exist in Europe. And there are some studies uh, done both in, at universities and uh, at European Commission that says that if we could just have a single digital market so that basically it operates as one European market, not, not 28 markets with different uh, regulations and tariff policies and so on, the European Union will add to, to its GDP about 1 trillion euro a year, 1 trillion euro uh, a year. <coughs> but that's something that, uh, that is uh, missing. So I'll finish with just a few thoughts. Uh, this is uh, fairly large, uh, a fairly large piece of uh, work, so uh, I don't uh, pretend to be uh, exhaustive, but from these uh, slides and another about 200 pictures, figures that we've uh, worked on for this book project, what are some of the things that come up? So I've already mentioned uh, uh, most of them. Uh, I mentioned the second one, digital trade, services um, uh, trade. Do I think as former and to some extent current policymaker that that's going to happen soon? No, there is no interest or maybe there is interest, but there is no drivers, policy drivers currently in the European Union to actually make digital trade um, uh, open. There are some small initiatives, but we are not about to, uh, to see that uh, happening. I mentioned education. Typically, Europeans pride, we pride ourselves on having good uh, education. And in some parts of Europe, like here, you do. But it turns out in other parts of Europe, education is actually quite bad. Bad by European standards and bad by uh, world standards. Mostly Southern Europe, some of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. But clearly a lot has to be done uh, uh, on, on just providing basic education and then good uh, university uh, services. Without that, it's kind of difficult to see how a high-tech sector can actually develop if you don't have the skills and the type of people who you need for that to, um, uh, to develop. A third point we haven't much discussed uh, uh, today, but it was uh, very prevalent uh, as a discussion point a year or two ago um, uh, in the Russian-Ukrainian um, uh, uh, when there was uh, issues between Russia and Ukraine, and it comes every two or three years um, to bite Europe, is that just like in digital trade, we are not a single market, even though we are supposed to be. Similarly, in energy, we are not a, similar mar uh, a single market either. So every country basically does its own deals with uh, Russia, with Qatar, with uh, whoever else. 
in terms of providing its own um, energy, it has its own uh, regulators, it has its own um, uh, energy uh, policy. And there have been many attempts to change this, including um, in the last few years when I was also part of uh, European policy makings, and they have all failed. And I, my prediction is that they'll continue to fail up to a point when some of the large countries, uh, particularly Germany, France, and Italy to some extent in Europe, understand that it's also in their own interest. So every time that there is a discussion of uh, single energy policy in the European Union, everybody says yes, applauds, and then the large countries quietly go away and do their own deals because they think that they can get better deals that way not part of the European Union, as a, and as a result, Europe is very little diversified in terms of uh, sources of um, sources of energy. We've touched a bit on the public expenditure. I think I'll leave it for uh, perhaps the panel um, uh, uh, discussion, but mention that a very significant part of uh, cutting public expenditures uh, and basically reducing them to a point where there is less need for taxation, so reduced taxation as well with uh, that, is the lack of pension reform. Uh, and it's linked to this topic that we started with, that uh, the European population is getting older and older, so we are aging as a continent, very few exceptions. Um, unlike both the US, where actually the population is uh, getting younger, and Asia, where the population is still getting younger for another 10 to 20 years, uh, in our uh, continent, we are annually losing about 2 million workers, or rather working age population, every year. So in a decade, we lose about 20 to 25 million working age um, uh, population. Here, I intentionally do not discuss yet the topic of refugees and migration. I think we'll leave it for the panel um, as well. Uh, but Europe is fairly rapidly uh, aging, and as a result, the cost of pensions and healthcare as well are rapidly getting higher and higher. So unless you somehow recreate the public expenditure system so you can accommodate for that, which is a trend we cannot really do much about uh, it, in the next decade or so, taxes will have to be increased and will have to be increased in every... Um, uh, in every country. And I also mentioned taxes on uh, labor. There is a bigger discussion on tax reform, but I think that's not a discussion at the European Union level. That's a discussion at the country uh, level uh, still, and I hope for some time to come. But a commonality across all European countries is that labor, well, except for Denmark, is that labor taxes tend to be quite high, and that's directly related to fewer people getting into the, into the labor market. And with that, I would finish here and uh, hope that somebody else can explain this slide for you. <laughs> and then we'll come back uh, in the questions and answers and the panel discussion. Thank you very much for your <laughs> attention.